Right, hello, welcome to my third? It's not good if I already can't remember how many I've done. My third Spelunky uh, daily challenge where I will be very challenged by the game that is Spelunky. I'm just um, going to look at how I did the other day. What day is it today? Hang on. Uh, it's the 7th. Oh, right, no, so this is today. Th these are the scores to beat. Okay, so if I can get $91,625, I'm categorically better than all my friends. That's a very disappointing showing by Lou Louis there. I don't know what he's... Look, he looks disappointed, doesn't he, in his profile picture. Um, that's the number to aim for. I just want to see how I did yesterday. Look at that, in the whole world... 623 out of all the spelunky people i think that's quite good i i feel quite confident today i am sat here i've i've had a shave i cut my nose while i'm shaving but i mean you know you have a look you can see i look a bit a little bit sharper um i've got a cup of tea it's very warm right now so i can't i can't drink that um look feel the heat feel the heat coming off that don't put your finger in it just can't take you anywhere uh, and I need a topic for today. Oh, I've got, I've got, by the way, I've got these uh, cookies, which are Sainsbury's Giant Extremely Chocolatey Cookies. This isn't sponsored by Sainsbury's, by the way. I've never seen these before. They're really nice. I've never, ever seen them before. I couldn't find them anywhere in the store. They were discarded in um, a, a bit of the store where they shouldn't be. Someone had clearly put the, oh, well, that's, uh, I'll be fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Someone had just put them aside. Ah! Oh, it's fine. We're all right. Someone had just put them aside. I'm not ready for this. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. It's the cookies. Someone had put them aside, and I found them, and I bought them, and they're really good. Uh, and I'm probably never going to see them again. Because they're, they're not anywhere in the store. And this is like a weird one-off. Anyway, today's topic is Kurt Vonnegut, which um, might be a topic that I flail on. I don't know. I've just... Ah! I'm just... To be honest, I had to calm down. I had a bit of some very nice scotch. I think it's had the opposite effect. Just, I didn't even have much. Come on, get up there. Didn't even have much of it. But, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend that, really, before spelunking. Uh, I don't think spelunking and alcohol mix. What's down here? Nothing. We're fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, Kurt Vonnegut is probably my favourite author, and I certainly tell people he is. Um, he's someone who I encountered probably moderately late in my life, though. I mean, lots of people... I, I started reading at a really young age. And uh, there were lots of books that I, I liked when I was younger. But I guess I didn't get really mad about literature until I was in my mid-twenties. And uh, I went to university and I picked up a copy of Slaughterhouse-Five, which is his most favourite book. His most favourite... His most famous book. And... It's not good, is it? Uh, and probably also my favourite book. Um, and I actually grabbed a load of cheap science fiction books while I was at university that were in no way relevant to anything that was on my reading list, but actually, funnily enough, turned out to be really, really useful things to be reading while doing a philosophy degree, which is what I did at university, which, by the way, is a really interesting subject, and it might be something that I talk about later on, maybe for a shorter Let's Play, because... Um, for all the stuff that I've studied... Oh, here we go, here we go. There we are, the struggling with the, putting the gloves on makes everything sticky. But that's not, none of this is about Kurt Vonnegut yet, so I better sort of stay on point, because otherwise I'm not going to write... T t no, no, tea break, tea break. Oh, that's the stuff. Oh, that's quite hot. Ah, right, I've been licked, I'm ready. Yes, continue. I know what I killed because I, I killed it. You don't have to tell me what I've done. It's fine. Um, spiders, very easy to kill because of those webs. Not really very well uh, 
designed bad guys in that respect, I suppose. Kurt Vonnegut was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in uh, 1922 on November the 11th. I'm doing this all the t off the top of my head, uh, but I think that's all right. Um, I read a lot about him while I was at university. I read loads of academic stuff and a lot of essays as well as a bunch of his books and some biographical stuff, although there's still a lot about him that I haven't read. For a while I genuinely thought I could do, I could have a go at doing a PhD in, in Vonnegut for the amount that I studied him. Um, he's the youngest in his family. He had an older brother called Bernard who ended up being a fairly famous meteorologist um, and quite a prominent scientist in his field. I think he invented some kind of cloud seeding technique which is basically where you drop a material uh, into the air and you make clouds, meaning you increase the likelihood that it will actually rain. Uh, rain. Um, and Kurt Vonnegut's dad was quite big on science and he thought science is going to be the new big thing uh, and it's great that my son Bernard is studying science and maybe my son Kurt should probably do some, some science studies as well. Vonnegut's dad was an architect um, and the Vonnegut family were fairly well known. Uh, they were a sort of prominent German-American family in Indianapolis, Indiana in the 1920s and 30s. And they were doing quite well until the Great Depression hit. And what tends to hit when, tends to uh, happen when depressions hit is the first people affected are people like architects in the construction industry because no one builds new stuff. Uh, oh, I really want a jetpack. Can I do this? Is there... A, mm, how much is it? I'm not... Oh, you've got to be joking, mate. You've got to be joking. Um, oh, fuck. Oh, tits! No, that, you're not throwing them where you're supposed to throw them. This is a disaster. Okay. You know what? I've got my jetpack. And I'm out of here. That, that is not what's supposed to happen. The idea was I would get a bomb sort of through the door on, onto the front of the, the shop and then another one on the shopkeeper. And I'll be honest, I was quite nervous and I got carried away. I don't know what's, I don't know what that guy's all about. I've seen him around. Uh, he scares me. What are you doing? Get away from me. I genuinely don't know what he does. He doesn't do anything. Oh, it's great. It's fine. He's a metaphor for the, the middle class. That's a joke. Anyway, so. Um, get it. Vonnegut's family were initially doing very well. And then the recession hit. And then they weren't. Uh, and this is fairly significant for a number of reasons. It's kind of significant for some of the quite socialist stuff that, that Vonnegut wrote later in life. He's well known as a science fiction author, but actually he wrote a lot of stuff that wasn't sci-fi. Oh dear, I've just... I've... Uh, so, can you get down there? Can you get down there and, and kill a dude for me? Because you seem to be my buddy. Don't, no, no, because he's going to shoot the dog somehow if I... Oh, please tell me you can shoot the shopkeeper. Please tell me I can... Right. I can't get to that. This is, you know what, my life has just become really complicated. If I... No! Why would you do that? Why would... Mate, that's not helpful. That is the exact opposite of what I wanted to have happen. This guy is terrible. I don't want to be his friend anymore. He is actually awful. Although that is a stroke of luck. So everything's fine. I'm happy now. Um, but yeah, Vonnegut was... Um, not just a science fiction author, he wrote about quite a lot of different things. And arguably, Slaughterhouse Five, which is his most favourite book. I've got to stop doing that. His most famous book um, isn't really science fiction, even though it features aliens and time travel. It's arguably a story about post-traumatic stress disorder. 
and that's really significant as well in Vonnegut's life, so I'll try and come to all this in a moment if I can possibly concentrate on what I'm doing. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry to all of you. Um, but one of the, the significant things about... Oh, blimey, she's quite demanding before she gives me anything, isn't she? Crikey. Uh, I might just get out of here because I feel like I'm pushing my luck, but that's what this is all about. Can I sacrifice this guy? If I can lead the ghosts round, I should be able to double back and be okay. Um, Vonnegut's mother came from quite wealthy family, and uh, I think Vonnegut himself says that he... He thinks she was fairly used to being well off and being married to an architect for a while they were doing fine. Uh, oh, God, I have this. And then they weren't doing fine anymore. Um, and he, I think he describes that as affecting her quite a bit, as in changing her into a fairly unpleasant person who didn't like the idea of, of not being anyone anymore, I suppose, of not being uh, well off. And he describes as becoming increasingly bitter and being openly very nice to people, but in private being actually quite, quite nasty and really struggling to deal with, with their poverty. Um, Vonnegut went to college, as lots of sort of, uh, you know, promising young men did. And he went to study, I think it was chemistry, uh, and he wasn't very good at it. He didn't do very well. And I don't know where I put the shotgun, quite frankly. But I'm not leaving this level without it. Oh, God. It's just so much luck being pushed here. All of... It rolled... It probably rolled over the shotgun, didn't it? The thing... Uh, anyway, so... I can't believe the guy pushed the shotgun onto the, the thing on the... It's just... What, what a jerk. That guy is a jerk. No, just, just, thanks. Okay, shotgun, any sign of a shotgun. I don't know what I'm doing, quite frankly. Uh, I'm out of here. Take that with me. Um, he didn't do great at chemistry. And he basically, in the mid-40s, when he was uh, about 20 years old, early 20s, he dropped out and he joined the army. And then in a very short space of his life, a number of quite major things happened. He, he failed at, at college, which was a big deal for him. And I think maybe a big deal for his family and his father. Um, oh dear. Oh, please, please don't turn. Oh, he, he's going to turn up. No, no. Oh, duh. Okay, where's he gone? Because he wasn't hitting the blast. Bombs are a lot less dangerous in this version of Spelunky, I swear. He's gone. He's gone. He's just gone somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, oh, rah. I don't. I, where's he going? You know what? I'm not waiting for him. Um, he dropped out. He joined the army. And while he was away in training, his uh, increasingly unhappy mother committed suicide. Or oh, that's actually not the phrase I should use. I'm sorry, she killed herself. She took her life. Um, Vonnegut was deployed in Europe after D-Day uh, because he was a bright young man who was made an infantry scout. So he had a not quite a regular army job. He had some, a few, I think, slightly more intelligent, more interesting things to do than the average infantry soldier. And as many people who have read Slaughterhouse Five will know, um, he was captured by the Germans. And I think, really, in a very short period of time, it was basically uh, drop out of college, join the army, mother commit suicide, go to war and then very quickly just captured by Germans. Which is an interesting thing to happen to you in the space of like a year or two in your... Uh, early 20s. Uh, but that's not really the end of it either, because after being captured by the Germans, he was taken to a city where, because he was a prisoner of war, he was supposed to do non-war-related work, so he was taken to a, a 
I'm not making any money. He's taken to a city that didn't really have a war industry. And the idea was that he'd uh, spend the, the rest of the war um, doing, I think, making vitamin supplements or something for pregnant women in uh, a city in East Germany called Dresden, far away from any war industries or, you know, it, it, where anything exciting was, was actually happening. Dresden, because it was an open city and it didn't have any kind of war industry or anything, wasn't really very well defended. Oh, that's nasty. The spiders don't drown in water anymore. Can I... Oh, I'm terrible with this. Yeah! Yeah! This gun is fun. It's useless, but it's fun. But, uh, yeah, it didn't have, have a war industry. Uh, it wasn't really defended. No one expected anything to happen there because there was no reason for anything to happen there because... Ah, uh, that's better. Fine. Because, you know, there's nothing there except a whole bunch of refugees. I had a lot of refugees because people went there because it's supposed to be safe. What is that? That's not in the original Spelunky. That, I'm not even happy that that exists, quite frankly. Oh, journal entry. Giant frog. Yes, I gathered that was a giant frog. Thanks. And there's a giant shopkeeper. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I won't pay for my crimes, mister, because you're dead. Yeah. It's going all right, isn't it? Um, but yeah, you know, Dresden is very pleasant, very old... German city with wonderful architecture. Uh, he meets a lot of German people for the first time, sees Germany suffering as it's coming to the end of the war, sees common people suffering. Um, and he's treated okay by the Germans, and it's fine. And then one day uh, the RAF come along, and what the RAF do is they firebomb Dresden because they're trying to help the Russians in the east advance, and they think it'll and the end of the war. So they drop a lot of bombs on Dresden. Oh no, a bit like... A bit like me getting carried away with my bombs there. Just got no bombs. If I find the secret door now, I can't open it. Alright, let's not play with the ghost. Vonnegut, because he's a prisoner of war, he's kept underground. He's kept in a slaughterhouse with, I think, uh, a load of meat. I think that's true. I think that's what happened. He's, he's kept in some kind of a basement. So he goes to bed one night. Dresden is firebombed whereby kindling is dropped on it first and then things are dropped on it afterwards to make the kindling catch fire so the whole city is, is burned. The whole city is levelled. He basically goes to bed one night uh, and there's a whole city there and he gets up the next day after surfacing from underground and the whole city is gone. Dresden just is a wasteland. He describes it being like the surface of the moon, just grey. Um, and there's a lot of debate about how many people actually did or didn't die in the bombing of Dresden, whether it was uh, several thousand or tens of thousands or even a hundred thousand. Because the city was full of refugees. Um, I think the figures nowadays are a lot more conservative where people say, wow, there weren't actually as many as we first thought. But uh, th the numbers are still, I think, fairly large. And then obviously any loss of life is significant. So this is all happening to Kurt Vonnegut by the time he's about 22, 23. So he's having a very interesting early 20s. A really, really, what I imagine is a massively difficult time. And I can't get to that crate. Um, and I think a few other slightly crazy things happened to him afterwards, after he left Dresden, which is um, he was with a... Uh, how am I going to kill this shopkeeper? He was in a column of refugees and POWs, I think, that were strafed by the RAF because they just thought they were the enemy. And I think a lot of people he was with were killed at the time. Which is again ever so uh, extraordinary and sad. And what a life to be having so far. Um, 
you can kind of, I think, fast forward through a few other bits of his life. He goes back home and he meets his first wife, and a bit like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, he goes back and he says, well, you know how uh, I was at war and you know, you've met someone else. Let's just have a chat. Let's go for a walk in the woods and have a chat. And, you know, I'm glad that you've met someone and that you're happy. This is really risky. That, uh, I should have... Not exercising my killer instinct. Well, it's quite a bit of money. Should have finished the guy when I had the chance. I've done I've done this many times. Uh, shall we see where I've ended up? It says five damsels. They're not damsels. They're dogs. But he does. But oh yeah, that'll do me. That'll do me. Top thousand in the whole world of people that play Spelunky Daily Challenge, which isn't many. Well, you know, it's, it's still good, basically. It's still good. Uh, he takes his, his first wife on a walk and just says things like, well, you know, let's, let's hang out, let's go for a walk, let's go to the forest, let's have a kiss, let's get married. And she goes, okay. And Kurt Vonnegut gets married after the war. And then I suppose you know what happens next, really which is that he goes on to, uh, he works for General Electric for a while and then he starts writing short stories about, sometimes about technology and sci-fi. Um, some of them are extremely good. Some of his uh, novels that he moves on to writing are extremely good and I'd recommend Slaughterhouse Five and Mother Night, which is also amazing. Uh, Cat's Cradle is a very popular one. It's not one of my favorites, but a lot of people like it. And you know what, Palm Sunday, which is a biography of his he wrote around 1980, is also really good. And then Timequake, which is his last full-length fiction, is very good as well. There's a lot of interesting themes in his work about occasionally, occasionally about socialism, about supporting other people, a lot of motifs about uh, powerless protagonist people who have a lot of things happen to them or who don't have a lot of control over their lives which to me sounds a lot like a Kurt Vonnegut in, a, in his early 20s. Um, I, I could tell you more, I can't tell you more because my daily challenge is over and I'm left looking at a scoreboard. So what I need to do now is try and encode this, make it a bit louder than last time, make it look a bit better and uh, have my tea. Thanks for watching and putting your finger in my tea, you strange person. Bye!